Today is Thursday, May the 9th, 2019. And the location of the interview is the American Red Cross office in Walla Walla, Washington. I am interviewing Melvin Johnson, a World War II veteran, and uh, he left the service as a T4, and he served from 1944 to 1946. Melvin was born June 18, 1923. Dixie Ferguson and Vic Phillips, uh, the videographer, are conducting the interview today. We represent the Blue Mountain chapter of the American Red Cross. So Melvin, uh, if you'll tell me the war and the branch of service that you served, which well, war? I was in the Army mm -hmm. and I was assigned in the medical department. I was a conscientious objector. Okay. They put the conscientious objector in, in medic or in communication to some place where they wouldn't have to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bear arms mm -hmm. necessarily. Mm -hmm. And my second assignment of being a clerk typist was a litter bearer. So uh, a what? A litter a bearer. Litter bearer. Uh -huh. So I had I had some uh, important <laughs> essentials, but it turned out that my ability to type fairly fast, 35, 40 words, was the most um, detailing or uh, most critical of where they put me. Mm -hmm. Like the Italian aid stations and medical offices and so forth. But my final assignment was with the GHQ of the MacArthur government. GHQ is what? Yeah, the uh -huh. General Headquarters. Mm -hmm. And uh, they put me in an office with a number of clerk typists that were typing up materials for the 30 lawyers that were assigned to facilitate the um, war crimes trials that were later held in Yoke. Yokohama. Okay, and Melvin, we're going to get into all of that in detail then. Um, so, uh, first of all, where, where were you born? I was born in Salem, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And were you drafted or did you yes, enlist? I, I was drafted in 44. And uh, I'm curious how the day that the letter arrived, do you remember that day and your parents? Not particularly. I was, I was expecting it because um, they had put me in 4F, which means a deferment, because I was uh, the spring, the first spring they called me a year before. I was underweight and the military wasn't willing to you know, draft me until I had remedied that. So my folks got a cow and I started drinking Jersey milk and I gained 15 pounds that year. Main problem was an infection and, and the fact that in the spring as a student we spent long hours and didn't take care of ourselves like we should have. Sure. And so I didn't pass my physical, and I was in the 4F for a whole year, and the following year I was expecting they'd call me, and they did, yeah. right from Walla Walla County. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, but you were in Salem at the time. I was. I was going to Walla Walla College, right out here in College Place. Oh. Okay. You were a freshman. When I was drafted, I was at the end of my junior year. Oh. How old were you then, Melvin, when you were drafted? I think it was 19, I think. I can't remember. Yeah. I'm guessing you probably were one of the older ones going in, is that correct, at yes, 19? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. I was one of the older ones. But you knew it was just a matter of time that that letter was going to come? Yeah. Okay. So you get the letter. What were you studying in college? I was a music major. Okay. All right. Had you played music all your life? Yeah. I even took a violin with me to the military service. <laughs> Good. 
Good. Not during basic training, but when I came back during my furlough, um, my folks had it for me if I wanted to take it. And I said, yeah, I want to take it along. I love that. So where was your basic training? Camp Barkley, Texas. That's where they sent a lot of would-be candidates for being medical people. And uh, did you know anybody there when you went to basic training? No, but they were nice to us there. Mm -hmm, good. Uh -huh. How long was it and what was it like? Six weeks of basic training in very hot weather. Mm -hmm. And they made us, re required us to take salt pills and, mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you like it okay? Oh, I was used to a hot country. I came from Nebraska before that, so it wasn't too hard to take. Uh -huh. uh, uh, just backing up a little bit, your plans were to come back to Walla Walla College then after the war, yes. or after your service. Uh -huh. But I didn't come back. Okay. Yeah, but we'll get into that. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Okay, so your basic was in Texas, and then where did you go? Well, I went to, um, I went to Seattle, um, Fort Lewis, mm -hmm. and spent the winter there. They were always thinking I'd be sent to San Francisco and be sent overseas, but things were delayed and, and then I didn't get to sent to the Pacific Theater until the spring. In fact, President Roosevelt died on the 25th of April, I believe it was, when, when our ship of 6,000 people was uh, going to um, first, we're going to New Guinea. Mm -hmm. But it had a problem. The skipper didn't want to sail a ship. It, it had a big responsibility with all those troops and the engines hadn't been checked out and we, because of a broken steam pipe and then some engine failure we went under the Golden Gate five times before we finally got underway. Um, I got seasick every time we got out in the, in the doldrums of, of San Francisco. My goodness. So your assignment after advanced training was down to San Francisco to board the ship for New Guinea. Yeah. And uh, did you know what kind of assignment you were going to have when you debarked? No, I didn't, but they, or they uh -huh. told us not to bring any money. <laughs> but where you're going, you won't need any money. <laughs> and you said, what do you mean by that? Huh? <laughs> well, after President Roosevelt passed away, um, we stayed pretty much on the south route to the Philippines. And that means going up at least about four days of, uh, through by New Guinea, Finch Hall and Hollandia. We picked up a hundred nurses there. That all yellow from the Adabrin, the pill. I'm sorry, all the way. Adabrin was a pill they took in place of quinine. Oh, okay. So you wouldn't get malaria. I see. And I thought I'd be smart and not take my Adabrin on the on the ship. Uh, and uh, and uh, we went through the line and. Uh, the KP people put stuff in your segmented tray. And I thought, well, I won't take my Adamant. I'll just lay it aside. They're supposed to take it, and they're supposed to watch you take it. But I just put it in a compartment in my tray. Why didn't you want to take it? I didn't want to turn yellow like I saw those nurses. And <laughs> so anyway, I was eating away at my dinner, and all of a sudden, I had a terrible taste. And one of the KPs had put some cabbage slaw with the juice in it that had dissolved my Edwin pill. And I had to 
quickly. It was so painful mm. to taste that taste of that stuff that I ran clear up on deck and spit the stuff out overboard. And <laughs> so I knew there's a reason they wanted to have you eat it, yeah. eat it in their sight. <laughs> And I learned my lesson. <laughs> it's amazing. That's an experience. It, it was a painful, and I had to climb a couple of stairways to get up mm -hmm. out of the mess hall. They usually put the mess hall down on the bottom of the mm -hmm. ship, so it would ride easier. And you, even then, you didn't sit down to eat. You stood up at a table, and mm -hmm. when the ship would lean one way, you'd lean the other way and eat your eat your meals that way. <laughs> well, Melvin, it's amazing 70 some odd years later, you still remember that experience. <laughs> yeah, I had one experience worse. Mm -hmm. It had, didn't have to do with food, but we were working in this place for these lawyers, these 30 lawyers, and they were about a half a block from MacArthur's headquarters in the Daiichi building at Cross from the moat of the Imperial Palace. Wow. We'd see the Japanese bow and scrape when MacArthur would drive up in his Packard. Wow. And, and this one time, um, we were going over to the Daiichi building, which had a um, mess hall on the fifth floor. And I was hungry, naturally. and. And I saw two people standing, waiting for the elevator to come down. And I, I was at least halfway across the mezzanine, and I made a beeline for that elevator and got in there first. Well, there was a Japanese valet accompanying General MacArthur himself. Mm -hmm. And I could tell he was upset. And he said, Joe, look. And he pointed to MacArthur's shoulder with five stars in a, in a circle. Wow. And that was humiliating to have a Japanese indicate that he didn't respect the how I disrespected MacArthur. Yes. And yes. so mm -hmm. we rode up together and I was embarrassed to no end. So was the Japanese. I don't know whether Jack MacArthur was embarrassed to see a GI do that, yeah. but oh. it wasn't required inside uh, to be a saluting. Mm -hmm. If it had been outside, uh, I would have probably had a, an MP come to cite me for yeah. not <laughs> saluting the general. <laughs> yeah. So you actually saw General MacArthur yeah, up close? Yeah, I was within wow. uh, about a foot of him. I could have touched him. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so anyway, uh, they had business on sixth floor and uh, I was relieved to get out on fifth floor and let them go on their <laughs> merry way. But I couldn't eat because yeah. I was so upset uh, for having uh, done this yeah. Diabolical trip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's the, the most my embarrassing moment in my life. Yeah. Having done that to a general of the Allied Forces yeah. of the Pacific. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. But he was a huge presence. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I'm curious to come back to that ship going over. How many days? Well, first of all, what was that like? going under the Golden Gate Bridge out into the ocean. Did you have any emotion? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. But it wore off by the time we'd done a fifth trip under. <laughs> <laughs> but the ship held 6,000 troops. Wow. And you can see why the skipper wasn't sure he wanted to take that many people with uh, not having it totally inspected. But mm -hmm. it was pretty important to get us on our way. Mm -hmm. Some of us had already been delayed for other reasons, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, well, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say the life on the ship was pretty peaceful because we went a southern route so we wouldn't be threatened by uh, subs. And we zigzagged a lot. Mm -hmm. all, all every now and then the ship would change direction. And we were on that ship for 
Oh, 45 days. Wow. Before we got to the Philippines. Wow. And none of us disembarked. And uh, it, we, I think there were more, there was more rejoicing amongst the people getting on land in Manila than there was <laughs> in, at any time that we were in the service. I, Even more rejoicing than when we got back to Seattle two years later. Well, well just the relief of getting off the ship? Yeah. Uh, I bet. Yeah. Uh, what did you do the whole time going over? I, I read and slept most of the time. I had my violin with me, but it was so damp in the hold where it was that I could hardly tune it. And uh, the sides of the ships would sweat, mm. and uh, so I I had my little military Bible, mm. and I read it completely through. Mm. I think during that ship trip, mm -hmm. my eyes were still good enough at that time, but they were just marginal, and I wasn't able to get glasses until on a furlough. I got some on my own in Portland, Oregon, um, but the military wouldn't issue me glasses. I knew my eyes were going bad, but they, they weren't bad enough to um, to justify them setting me up for a appointment. I see. You had to meet a certain criteria to get eyeglasses? Yeah. I see. Uh, well, you certainly spent uh, your time well going over. Yeah. You did. Uh, did you have thoughts, a lot of thoughts, about where you were going? The uncertainty no, I of was, it? I just sort of lived one day at a time. Mm -hmm. And it was pleasant on deck, but we spent a little time down in the, the second, you know, the second, um, Hold, I guess it's second hold. I think the, the, the very lowest ones where we ate our meals. Mm -hmm. So the ship was 45 days and then another 10 days added that to that was spent coming back to Seattle two years later. And Same ship? No, it was, it, was a, it was a pretty slow ship I thought though. <laughs> but, as usual, I collect stuff, and I had the, the biggest barracks bag plus my violin. <laughs> so you collect what? I collect stuff. One, um, one of my friends, he wanted. He was a ham radio operator, and he said, "Would you see if you could get this through to the states for me?" <laughs> and the inspected all our baggage and this guy who inspected, he says, I'm not authorized to let the electronic stuff to go, but I'm putting this walkie-talkie, the Japanese walkie-talkie, which he wanted as a souvenir, this yeah. friend of mine. Yeah. So he said, I'm putting it over here. If you want to risk taking it, he said, I'm not sure whether there'll be any more inspections. And so my buddies said, well, if you don't go get it, we'll get it for you. <laughs> and they brought it, and I put it in my barracks bag, and it remained there, there until we got to the States. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I delivered it to him in, <laughs> in the Portland area. Oh, that's a neat story. <laughs> that was Ivan White House. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a great story. That's the, that's the only thing I did uh, wrong as far as regulations. I didn't sell stuff that was contraband and mm -hmm. make money on cigarettes and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Well, that's pretty innocent, Melvin. Uh, I'd say that. <laughs> uh, what were your sleeping quarters like on the ship, and did you have any communication from home, or could you write letters? No communication whatsoever, but the, the sleeping was about four high on little canvas um, hammocks that had a rail, so you, well, for the officers, they had a rail so you wouldn't fall off, <laughs> but for the the enlisted men, 
we just had to hang on uh, if we had rough seas mm -hmm. and after I got home I bought a couple of those officers beds <laughs> that were designed to keep the, the, the elite from rolling out on the floor. <laughs> kind of like a crib, huh? <laughs> yeah, Lee has one that he picked up. Oh my gosh. We use them for top carriers for cars. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. you uh, Did you have a lot of rough sailing going over? Yes, mm -hmm. it was pretty rough for about 500 miles out of San Francisco, very rough. Did you get seasick? Yes. Well, you said you every time. Oh, every time. Uh, yeah. Every time he went out. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's not. Went good. out three times, and I got sick every time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, how? What would you say the mood was among six thousand GIs going over? You said it was pretty quiet and peaceful. Well. They played cards a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I found something on board ship that later turned out to be a cousin of my wife's. Oh, my it was a pocket knife. And I could have kept it, but I took it to the lost and found. Oh. And uh, the only thing I have as a souvenir for that ship voyage is I found a sort of decrepit uh, electrician's wire cutting mm -hmm. tool, oh. something like a side mm -hmm. cutting, and I still have you that. Still have that, they wow. It had a nose on it so you could make the curl to fit the screw into a uh, um, receptacle. My goodness. <laughs> well, you mentioned President Roosevelt passing away. Did you say that was right at the time you were... Out in the middle of our trip. Right in the middle. What did you, what did everybody think about that? Well, you know, we didn't say too much about it. Did that make you feel like, oh, uncertainty? Yes, I think that most of the troops felt sure. a little bit uncertain sure. about who would take his place. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so, did you stop anywhere along the way before? Was, yes, uh -huh. we did. Uh -huh. We stopped at a little place on the eastern end of the New Guinea. And, and then we sailed for a couple more days and we came to a place called Hollandia. That's where we picked up the hundred nurses that were all yellow from being there while taking this Adabrin pill that substituted for quinine. And well, will you explain that? You picked them up to do what with the nurses? Well, it was to reinforce the medical field of I suppose in the Philippines. They probably had a call for them because that was our next stop. Oh, I see. In Manila. I see. The I Japanese see. were very cruel and harsh to the Philippines. Yeah. They were sure glad the Americans were finally winning out. Yeah. And I came just as we were mopping up. I say in the Philippines we found them. Typically they were about starved. And no food hardly. And so the little children would come with, um, you know, like uh, canning buckets, like canned peaches, little, little cans, about a, three quarters of a gallon. They'd come with those, and if we had anything we weren't wanting to eat, mm -hmm. they uh, were given food so they could take it home to the families. Mm -hmm. So we shared from our chow lines. Mm -hmm. with the Filipinos that came. They were desperate. And huh? We came there during the muddy, muddy season and we ate our meals standing up, no tables, standing up in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, wow. So the, the nurses, there were about a hundred nurses that yes, you brought? Yes, we, we never saw anything more of them in uh -huh. the Philippines. Okay. But uh -huh. I assume they were assigned to different hospitals in in the Philippines. Oh goodness, that's really something. Were, they were well enough. They just had uh, they had just 
they were well enough to continue serving though the nurses yeah. um, mm -hmm. boy so how long uh, how long did it take you to get to the Philippines then was it just I'd say um, um, after Roosevelt died it took us another couple of weeks okay so where did you land in the Philippines Manila in Manila and we saw the ship that the Japanese had sunk with their airplanes it's kind of like you know, you know in uh, Hawaii uh -huh. there were sunken ships and this was after the Bataan March mm. and uh, but the, there was starvation going the Americans had been incarcerated in these camps and practically starved by the Japanese mm -hmm. and but the civilian population in the Philippines was, was really harshly treated mm -hmm. and so we tried to do, be on good terms with them mm -hmm. and we didn't know at the time that MacArthur fulfilled his promise when he said he'd be back and that was uh, before you arrived? Okay, yeah, uh -huh. he had a, evidently owned a hotel in the, right in the Philippines and so uh, we were the troops were mopping up the Japanese who were hidden in caves uh -huh. uh, quite some distance from Manila and that's where they sent me and since I was a non-combatant -com uh -huh. they assigned me to be a post clerk uh, work in a post office, which I wasn't very qualified for, but <laughs> <laughs> I took it anyway. And at night, I would hear the big guns going over my head because uh, American soldiers were still trying to get rid of the Japanese in their caves, and they finally could, couldn't get them rid of them in any other way but to use flamethrowers mm. like they did on. Um, what was it? Mount Sergachi? Uh, yeah, yeah, and one, some of the other islands. Mm -hmm. Iwo Jima? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Melvin, uh, I, I want to go back to what you saw in the harbor. Were there a. By the way, what year would that have been? 45? When yeah. you came into yeah. Manila? Uh, 1945. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it might have been 44 yet. Late 44? Uh -huh. I, I, I know it was an April 25th or something like that that mm -hmm. Roosevelt passed away and they announced it on our PA system. Yeah. That was 45. 45, yeah. So, uh, could you describe a little bit more when you came into Manila? Is that, was that going to be your base headquarters for a while then? You were gonna... uh, no. They wanted to train us for a invasion of Japan, mm -hmm. and uh, and we were already replacing troops that were practically uh, eligible to go back to the states, mm -hmm. and we so we went to a place called Cabana Tuan, is up north of um, um, the Philip, north of Manila, about 90 miles. Okay. But we got to come uh, to Manila periodically just you know really boredom and then I I would go there to go to church I had a week weekend pass in fact the only pass I ever had mm -hmm. overseas was a weekend pass no no three-day passes or anything mm -hmm. I had to stick pretty much to my job <laughs> <laughs> okay so could you Spell that for Vic where you were assigned. Kibana Tuan. Uh -huh. C A B A N N A. T U A N. T U A N. Very good. I don't good. know that it means something Kibana in Spanish, Tuan. but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, so that was going to be your assignment for a while to yeah. to do what now? To get ready to go oh, yeah. to uh -huh. invade Japan. Uh huh. And what were you doing daily there? Just doing like a lot of the others, just resting. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was a piano there, and uh, I knew I was very deficient in the capability of playing the piano, so mm -hmm. every afternoon I'd go over and see what I could do on it. But All right, so piano and violin. Yeah. 
How, what, anything else? No, but I did practice my violin at night. All right. Yeah. That's fabulous. And I had a lot of music with me. And fabulous. So I worked on that Fritz Chrysler arrangement of the Bach A minor. Oh, my. And the one that Hannah Oh, played. my. And the one oh, my. That, I mean, I had, uh, Melvin, you sound like at a young age you were a very accomplished musician. Well, I was a music major, actually, yeah. so yeah, I, I wanted to be a physics major, but the labs at Walla Walla College conflicted greatly with my music courses, and I, d I had to take a choice, so I decided mm -hmm. on music. Music, yeah. yeah. I think my parents were pleased about <laughs> that. But Indeed. since then, I've sort of had mechanical interest, mm -hmm. and that's most where my spare time has gone, just mm -hmm. working on things like children, children's toys. Oh my, uh, you've got a left brain, don't you? <laughs> I told Lee that that little aluminum scooters that has small wheels oh. that the, the Japanese imported here, yep. I said a, a couple of years before that I made one just like it out of wood, same size, my and goodness. maybe better rolling, a little bigger wheel than me. I use snowmobile, snowmobile boogie wheels <laughs> for, the, for the wheel. I still have it hanging in my garage as proof that I wow. actually made something. You could have been a millionaire, Melvin. <laughs> well, I sure miss it. By, and then I, I copied a very uh, almost mysterious um, um, device I developed, I copied it from a German idea, mm -hmm. uh, and that is what we call forkless steering. And the people at the, mirror, at the machine shop says, "This, I just don't see how this is going to be done. But I, I said, I'll bring you a sample. And they were aghast at what they well, saw. Well, what is it? It's I take a motorcycle wheel yeah. and cut out the opposite side and then I put a big tractor bearing inside where the brake drums or brake shoes would, would be. And then I use the automobile U joint, the smallest you can get, and use the very needle bearings that are in this uh, US automobile. Um, you, you join and make a wheel that's steerable that I've used on at least three of my pedal car inventions. Oh um, the, two of these are for two people to sit side by side. Oh. And, uh, and then my other, I bet I had five of these pedal cars. And the first two I made for my grandkids My and they were four-wheelers but since I got this special steering of a forkless steering with a motorcycle wheel I built three using that invention and no Japanese no Chinese have succeeded in uh, doing this invention because it's word. very a lot of hand work in it yeah. and and they said, I don't see how you can steer it. <laughs> Did you ever patent anything? I didn't patent it. I probably could get a patent on it. Yeah, fascinating. Well, uh, yeah, you, when, can, uh, you can go the world around and never see it. My word. But you have it here in Walla Walla. I have three samples of it. Wow, I bet your grandkids are... <laughs> one, well, one for two people that steers in the back and one for two people that steers in the front mm -hmm. and then one that just for one person and that's oh, the one Lee likes the best. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it steers in the back. It's like driving a forklift truck. <laughs> <laughs> you know you've seen these forklifts that mm -hmm. steer in the back and that's the way these work. Oh, so children's store, uh, toys and things like that have always interested me and, mm -hmm. and of course I, 
I'm doing innovation on bicycles. I use a lot of bicycle parts. And right now I'm just finishing a, a three-wheel bicycle using a girl's frame mm -hmm. and and it has two steerable wheels in front. Mm -hmm. Most three-wheel bicycles are for old people mm -hmm. and they have one steerable wheel up front. It's simple to make, but the one I'm making takes parts from three different bicycles and combines them in a way so you can steer the two front wheels. Gosh. And here you are, almost 96, a very gifted man. My, very my gifted. biggest co collection, um, I guess, I'd say, is bicycle wheels. Yeah. Who would believe it? <laughs> I have about 120 inch bicycle wheels, so I can select any wheel I want for a particular job I want. That's really very... I hang, I hang them up way out of the way. I used to keep them in the attics, mm -hmm. and now I hang them up between <laughs> floor joists. And so if you wow. wanted pictures of them, you could see them hanging there today. My goodness, that's very interesting. So. What, was this something you were working on when you were in the military then? It, it, it was something I started working on when I started teaching music. Okay. Teaching music is fairly taxing, mm -hmm. so it was something I relaxed with. Mm -hmm. And my son has the, the, the traditions of the, yeah. the Walla Walla College Music Department mm -hmm. here, showing different places I have taught. Yeah. I started teaching in Chicago wow. and then the, the head of the music department at Walla Walla College asked me to come and teach for them in the 1950s. Wow. I spent four year, years there mm -hmm. and he, this one book shows where a great tradition has a picture of myself uh, in, in that music department. Oh. I had the orchestra and the five strings mainly. Mm -hmm. but, well, we're gonna. We're gonna I, uh, I, I did take my master's degree in uh, general knowledge of all the instruments of the band and the orchestra. So no matter where I went, I would be able to teach these in a, at least an elementary way. Well, we're gonna get to that in a few minutes. We're gonna we're gonna get back into your war experiences here, and we'll evolve over to this uh, amazing career you've had. Well, I'll just sum things up about the mechanical things. Mm -hmm. I built three tractors. The first one started made out of wood. These were all powered tractors with motors on them. <laughs> and, and then I built a big one you could use for plowing, pulling sleds in the winter time. Or, and then the last one I built for Lee when he was just, how old were you? <laughs> Oh, probably five. Um, <laughs> maybe seven or eight, I think. Anyway, it right. would turn circles and had That's individual fun. breaks, and it was fun. And we still got that one, and um, fun. my wooden one I gave away to a kid who was mechanically minded and played the cello, and then Lincoln, Nebraska, and then the big one that is the one that's most useful. It's still in pieces. I took it apart when I shipped it. Mm -hmm. And it's about 260 miles away at a ranch in the oh, mountains and oh, near Paulville. But I never did get it together and I still probably won't. Well, what a fun dad. By the way, yes. and I, <laughs> what I apologize for, I failed to introduce your son, Lee Johnson, who is sitting here at the beginning of the interview. So I have to put that in no, there. Roger, that Lee is here with you. Roger generally does the interviews at the radio station. Uh -huh. My son, Roger, is a pastor. Oh, okay. Yeah. And oh, okay. Lee, wanna, uh -huh. Lee is a registered nurse. Oh. And he took his early training out at community college okay. and then had later oh. training in different places and had quite a lot of hospital uh, experience. Mm -hmm.
but he's taking good care of me. Uh, your blessed family. Well, a very gifted family. Well, Melvin, I'm going to bring you back to the Philippines here for a few yeah. minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how long were you up in Cabana, Tuan, Helen? Oh, we, we were there uh, about six months. Okay. And then it became September, and then September 16th, the Japanese signed um, uh, after the dropping of the atomic bomb, mm -hmm. they signed the surrender yep. on this ship. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether MacArthur was there, probably was. But yes. Yeah, he was. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, do, you, do you remember that day when the atomic bomb dropped in August? Um, do you remember hearing about I, it? I remember hearing about it, yeah. Everybody was in awe of yeah. the of the expected or un unknown, unknown mm -hmm. results that might occur in, in the land, whether the land would be yeah. um, polluted yeah. or what do you call, yeah. you know, what's another the term? Radiation. Radiation. The radiation. Yeah, the radiation yeah. outcome of that was quite a mystery. Of course. Uh, did you even know what an atomic bomb was? No. no. Couldn't nobody. Yeah. We just knew our secret. leading us scientists, or oh, down in the, the Manhattan Project mm -hmm. down in Tennessee, were working on it. And did it you hear about secret. that? No, we didn't know all the top yeah. secret stuff at all. Sure. Yeah. I had a friend who gassed up the plane. Um, what the nose gay? Enola Gay? Yeah, Enola Gay. Wow. And um, he said that wow. the bomb was about 10 feet long and, and they had to have a special pit to put it in so that their, their hoist, uh, so they could get the plane over it to use winches to get it up in the bomb bay. Wow. Yeah. And your friend was gassing that plane? Yeah, he gassed up the plane. Yeah. On that particular day? On, on that very wow. day that they sent it over in uh, Hiroshima. Did he have a clue what was going on, do you think, your friend? No. Yeah. This is, it was so secret. It was secret. Uh -huh. But yeah. he had to say, now this is, this plays a little different yeah. than the others. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, that's really interesting. Yeah, well, I later taught him violin lessons, and no he's the one that told me that. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Well, he had a special place in history, because sure they did. couldn't have gotten there without somebody, the guests. <laughs> somebody like you should have interviewed well, him. <laughs> I tell you what, if he didn't put gas in the plane, they wouldn't have gone. Yeah. <laughs> Well, anyway, so when you heard about the dropping of the bomb, how is that going to affect all of you that were going to go to Tokyo? We then? were very thankful. Uh -huh. We don't have the slightest doubt, but what was the whitest thing for Truman to authorize? Mm -hmm. That was the one thing he did that was a good, good move. And, and why do you say that? Because there could have been a lot of pressure against dropping that bomb if they, if the military people had all known how devastating it would be. Uh -huh. But it brought the war to an end without the sacrifice of a lot of uh -huh. American lives. And we know the Japanese were going to fight to the last uh -huh person alive to defend that island of theirs. Mm -hmm. And that was common knowledge that yes. they would fight the, the to way the they fought on those islands was mm -hmm. a spectacular, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you obviously got the assignment to go to Tokyo. Yeah. And uh, were you a little hesitant knowing that the bombs had been dropped? Or oh, no. That much. Um, uh -huh. I had friends who went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki to see the results, but it was bad enough to see how devastated Tokyo was. Well, can you describe that? Yes, there were miles and miles 
of nothing but foundation, cement foundations or stone foundations, and the scores of smokestacks from small little factories that had been right in the residential area of Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. uh, these were firebomb results. Uh, mm -hmm. The Japanese completely were, you know, overwhelmed with fires. Mm -hmm. No wow. way they could have put them out. Yeah. We had incendiary wow. bomb raids that was way more, killed way more people than the, than the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. wow. They had to rush to the river. The heat from those fire storms was spectacular. Um, was there radiation in Tokyo when no, you were there? No was radiation. There? Uh -huh. no. And what part of Tokyo were you in, uh, Melvin? Well, we went to sort of the, the outskirts of Tokyo to a little church that was called Suganami Ku, where the American GIs would meet with the remaining Japanese something they had in a, that were still alive who hadn't been uh, persecuted because of their religious yeah. point of view. Yeah. Anybody that believed that the emperor wasn't a god himself, uh, such as a Christian that served another god, right. he was suspect, or they called them spies, mm -hmm. and so were there Adventist there missionaries? Many, there uh -huh. weren't very many left. Okay. Were there Adventist missionaries in the country? Yes. Before and the bombing? They became, uh, two of them became leaders in the reorganization of the Japanese government after the war. MacArthur appointed them because of their skill yeah. and language and the culture of the Japanese people. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, Wow, and they were former no, missionaries. One, was put, uh -huh. up, one right. was put in charge of the reorganizations of the education, and another one that was put in charge of something that would replace Shintoism. Shintoism. Because that was the worship of the emperor. Oh, okay, yeah. And so oh. MacArthur realized that he had to strike where made a difference in the next, in the, new, in the new generation coming up. What made him so smart? I don't know. He was far-sighted, no question about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did he uh, establish headquarters right there in Tokyo then? Yeah, and that's where I worked, all right. My, my work was about three buildings away from MacArthur's wow. headquarters building across from the Imperial Palace. Melvin, describe all of that. Oh, well, there's a, a nice sight because it hadn't been bombed. Americans didn't strike the um, area near the Imperial Palace. That was for on purpose. Yeah. Because so they wanted to know. They wanted to have somebody that could deal with it, the Japanese respected, and so it was through the. MacArthur's dealing with the emperor himself that we were able to have a successful occupation. So the emperor, did he stay in the palace after the war? Yes. yes. Uh, what was his position? Tojo was his name, I think. Oh. But they did um, put him up for war crimes and, then, and they were easy on him. They should have hung him, but most of the people whose cases I worked on were giving life imprisonment, and none of them were, that I recall were actually uh, killed or outright, like hung and being hung or uh -huh. shot. Well, okay, but can you describe the details of what you what you did on a daily basis? Well, we would get um, handwritten. Um, sheaves of paper, or maybe six or eight pages, and on these pages were handwritten 
the experiences that the prisoners of war went through, Australians and Americans and New Zealand and any allied prisoner British, that, uh -huh. that had, had been mistreated, um, he was invited to send this commission of lawyers uh, their grievances against certain they, they would actually name and describe the, the guards that were wow. responsible for mistreating them then. Uh, uh, were the lawyers from all the countries or American lawyers? I think maybe there might have been some from England, mm -hmm. but anyway, we didn't have any communication with the lawyers except if we didn't type well or <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but we were instructed if a uh, allied prisoner of war misspelled a word, we were supposed to do it also on our typewriters. Oh, interesting. And that kind of got to be pain in them. Yeah. Uh, so. How, uh, uh, okay, getting back to a typical day, so what, what literally were you typing the reports of the brutality against the PW? Yeah, and, and what made it worse, yeah. we had, that was before we had any duplicating machines except mimeographs. Yeah. And, and uh, what was that other one, the early one, but mm -hmm. um, anyway, a ditto, some sort of ditto yes, machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we would pack uh, up to six copies of thin paper in our typewriter and had to beat those typewriters Gosh. hard enough to oh. imprint the last seat. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it, it was tedious work and I was always uh, glad when the day was over. Never, no vacations. Just a <sighs> weekend now and then I go to visit a Japanese family uh -huh. and we'd have kale and whatever their little uh, vegetables, that's what they then they put in the foundations that remained after the buildings burned down. You could see they're growing a winter crop. Oh, Did they re well, I want to learn about the Japanese, but getting back to the typing, you just typed all day long for how many yeah. hours a day? Oh, uh, we were uh, out of, uh, at least six hours a Ooh, day. Ooh, that would be hard. And you get a headache after a while. Not only that, the the substance of what you were typing. Yeah. I it, mean, can you? I know it's gory, uh, but well, can you give was some stories? Way worse than we thought it was when we got into it. Yeah. Can you give an example, maybe, of what, what you learned? The main the main thing I remember distinctively is uh, in the prisons how they would starve them and beat them and then give them the water treatment if they misbehaved. Mm. And uh, one, of this, one of these missionaries that was from Germany to Japan, mm -hmm. he was thought to be a spy and they beat him with bamboo poles. Mm -hmm. He said his head swelled up, was about twice as big as uh, just like an egg mm -hmm. shell. Uh, and he lived uh, through it. Yeah. And, in fact, I paid for his daughter's wedding when I came back to the stage. My goodness, that's amazing. <laughs> his name was Dietrich, <laughs> and uh, his daughter lived on the outskirts of Portland and Oregon, and I, what a story. I became acquainted with her, and she asked me to play. I played the wow. handle movement, that one in the minor key, handle number three, I think, or My four. Goodness. Yeah. Little did you dream one day you'd be playing the wedding music. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, how many reports do you think, uh, on an average, do you think that you typed? Well, we would concentrate on certain ones they thought they could draw, draw up a case against. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose we were involved in three or four people at one time. And, uh -huh. And the, the Oklahoma trials were coming up in the spring, and I left about the time they started the trials. I, I left in May and came back. In 
where, where did you get the information? Where was that found, all that information about how brutal they oh, were? Oh, they had, they had interviews, just like you were interviewing me. Uh -huh. They had some officers that interviewed these prisoners that were mistreated. Oh. Yeah. Oh, and all that was being written down then? Yeah, and then they had people that had a ability to do shorthand, I guess. And oh. Interesting. So they could talk fast that way. Interesting. So then when you got done typing the report, the lawyers would take that report to yeah. the trial. Yeah. What, where, where were these guards? Were they in prison, the ones that were doing all the brutality? I don't know what building they had, but they, they had them in Yokohama so that it, it, they could be visited by international people. Could see that fairness was meted out to the. Yeah. the well, what happened to a lot of them well, to, the after thoughts, the trial? Some of them were sent to the Philippines in a in a big jail down there, oh. and some of them became Christians. Believe it or not. I believe you. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, were they in prison for life in the Philippines? Yes, then? yes they were. For life. They didn't wow. send them down there for short term. They sent them down for there life. for life imprisonment. Uh, were there a lot of them? I don't know how many. Uh, I wouldn't surpri be surprised there were 15 or 20 that received the, the maximum yeah. sentence of life imprisonment. Did you ever see one of them, Melvin? No, never did. What? Uh, did you ever meet one of them that became a Christian? No, and I never did. Wouldn't that be interesting? Wow, there must be books or something written about this somewhere. Oh yeah, there are. Yeah. So was, I'm just curious, typing all of this darkness, did it get to you? Well, really it did. I didn't, I didn't enjoy that no. part of the military very much. Yeah. How can you explain why they were so brutal? Well, they they didn't have any morals like Christians did. It was dog eat dog, and even in their own military, the officers were very harsh to the mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. that they trained. I read a story. Uh, I was a kamikaze pilot. And he tells about his experience becoming a pilot and how so some of the superior officers really would mistreat the the you know, cadets or yeah. whatever the, the yeah. learners, knowing they weren't going to come home. Yeah. Uh, do you think the emperor knew all of this brutality? Do you think he was aware of all of this? I don't think he knew a lot of it. Uh -huh. I think it was above and on, uh, beyond what he uh -huh. expected. But uh -huh. they were educated in the Shinto religion, which means that they were supposed to be the, just like Hitler, Hitler said, the Germans were the master race. Uh -huh. and uh, They believed it. Their sun worship was part of it. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Did you feel darkness in the country when you were there? The war? No, I, I really I really avoided a lot of just having a faith of my own. Uh -huh, sure. Uh, did you get out to the countryside to see any of the damage done outside only, of Tokyo? Only on the weekends. Um, 24-hour pass. That was my maximum. I never had a three-day pass to go to you know, Nagasaki or uh, you know, Hiroshima. You didn't you know, see that no, destruction, uh-huh. And I never got to go to one of the resorts where they had mm -hmm. uh, geisha uh, girls and mm -hmm. community baths and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Uh, were you hearing uh, from other people about Nagasaki and Hiroshima? Coming back and forth, were you hearing reports about it? The the cities. Not cities? much. No, uh -huh. Very, very little was said. What, what what were your living conditions like there when you were there, and how long oh, were you there? Not very good. Mm -hmm. um, our first 
place was a an airplane hangar for hundreds of us there were just some old army cots and maybe an, an army blanket that we had with us in our pack yeah. and and then the next move we made was north of Tokyo at a former air base and we were assigned to the same barracks the Japanese were and they were full of fleas. Oh my. I was bitten all over with fleas. Oh. And wow. Wow. <laughs> I only like one thing about that barracks. <laughs> when you go to clean it, there's a trap door and you can sweep all the dirt <laughs> through that door and not use any dustpans. Wow. <laughs> well, did you eat pretty well? Was the food decent? What that? The food, was the food decent? Were you fed pretty well? Eating, say? eating. Oh, uh, did we eat pretty well? Uh -huh. uh, actually, we lacked a lot of things. Uh -huh. um, all the time I was in Japan, very near the time we were to be sent home, uh -huh. we got a shipment of tangerines from Australia. Uh -huh. Little <laughs> tiny tangerines. That's the only fruit. Uh -huh. No fresh milk. Uh -huh. Just. Uh, canned can, and, can and, uh -huh. and so, sea rations. Yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a very limited. Yeah. Uh, and we did get lettuce once. Did you? <laughs> yeah. And, and the army had they get, they did what they could with what they had. Yeah. You got some letters from home. Yeah, and uh -huh. and we got. These little tangerines from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> that was a treat. So how long were you there all together, Melvin, in Tokyo? A little over a year. A year. That's yeah. a long time. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested, when you went to visit the Japanese families, were you warmly received by them? Well, they belonged to the same church I went oh, to. Oh, gotcha. The, the Adventist church. Yeah. And they had... The Adventists had a small group of people that were faithful through the Amazing. through the war. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, how about the Japanese people in general? Did you have much contact with them? Uh, not the general population very much. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just limited. Yeah. Um, uh, I never did learn anything. Uh, other than the Sayonara, would <laughs> <laughs> like but goodbye and right. uh, especially uh, goodbye. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think I asked you before you you got to see General MacArthur on occasion. You got to see General MacArthur once in a while. No, no. I the the Japanese person I saw the most was a graduate of the. the Tokyo Imperial Conservatory. Okay. She was a pianist mm. that played music at our church and her husband was an artist. And when I would be assigned to play music at church, mm -hmm. I would go to her house and we'd rehearse it. Wow. And she was kind of sentimental mm -hmm. because when, when one time I was there rehearsing with us, they just had um, 100 watts instead of 120 watts, so the, the light bulbs, and I suppose they were American bulbs, just kind of were yellow, and she had a, a light bulb there by her piano uh, on a, on a, I don't know whether it stood on the floor, anyway, it stood somewhere. I said, if we would lift the one side of this shade up, we could get more light on the music. Yeah. And, you know, uh, she wrote me a letter after I came home and told about life in Japan after we left. Oh, uh, do and you still said, have those letters? She said, uh -huh. you notice shade still a slant. Wow. The shade still a slant. Yeah. And I thought, well, she was quite sentimental. Yeah. And the other Japanese uh, was part German. Mm -hmm. Her mother was involved in the church work and mm -hmm. translating books and into English. And, uh, and her daughter said, you know, 
we used to get the Beethoven sonatas from Germany. We can't get them anymore. And she, when you go back to the States, would you be able to buy me the, the two volumes of the Beethoven sonatas for piano? Wow. And that's the one thing I sent back oh, to her. Great and she, story. And later she visited, uh, she married one of the GIs. Oh. And later she uh, came over and gave me a beautiful kimono. Oh. I don't think I carried it in my barracks bag. I wouldn't have thought of carrying <laughs> such a thing. They, oh. I still have that. Do you? Oh my. Yeah. Oh and my. so there was, there was some sentimental things yes. going on. And this, this one that um, played the piano for me, when I went to the train station to leave for the last time, mm -hmm. she went out of her way and went several train stops with mm -hmm. me. And, and I said, well, you need to go back to your husband. Yeah. She was fairly attached to, uh, to me because of the music. Absolutely. You know, that's a sort of a, mm -hmm. a universal language. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so I remember those uh, things. It's yeah, a wonderful story. Yeah. The bright side of the war. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you bet. Did you get to see her in the United States? No, she didn't come. It oh. was. Mm -hmm. It was. Um, that German uh, Japanese um, girl that one of the Beethoven sonatas she's the one that came to the States with mm -hmm. her GI husband okay. afterwards okay so that's the, the last of the contacts I had with mm. the Japanese yeah. that I dealt with did uh, you ever go back no. uh, Melvin I Never had went back. no desire to go back for some reason yeah. I like I like how how polite they are and all that and, and how industrious they are. Mm -hmm. A little different than some countries where the the women do all the work and the men sit by, but mm -hmm. in Japan the, both the men and the women yeah. cooperate yeah. fairly yeah. equally, I would mm -hmm. say. When you left Japan, was there a beginning of the reconstruction of Japan or were they just still in chaos when you left? They were still in real bad shape but the U.S. government made sweetheart arrangements for the Japanese to get lumber mm -hmm. for as cheap as ten dollars a thousand board feet wow. and we sent millions of board feet over from our Alaska and Tonga National Forest mm -hmm. at that sweetheart agreement until Mm -hmm. The Congress found out about it and put a stop to it. Interesting. In, in other words, we were our loggers were denuding some of our prime force mm -hmm. just to favor the Japanese oh, to rebuild. But we rebuilt them so well that they did they didn't re regret yeah. the war. In fact, it gave them a boost in yeah. their economy. Yeah, and look at them today. Yeah. Boy, I'll say. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I could just ask you so many more questions about that time frame, but gosh, you had a unique. Ha, has all of the stories and the typing still stuck with you all these years? No, my typing is gone awry. And how about the stories that you type? Well, the stories are kind of big, you know, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because they were mm -hmm. pretty. Pretty heavy. Yeah. Pretty heavy. You had yeah. a special job. Were there quite a few of you typists doing this? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I'd say a couple dozen of us. Yeah. That's, that was a there, very For unique. every lawyer, I think, we, they kept on a couple yeah. of typists busy. Very It was unique. a big office. It was a big, yeah. it was really a, a big place where we worked. Oh, I bet. Very unique situation. Well, Melvin, so I'm going to bring you home now. So you, <laughs> so yeah. you're on, you're on the ship coming back out of Tokyo Bay, yeah, then back to San I, Francisco. I had, a, I had a sprained ankle and the oh, heaviest uh, barracks bag and, and all that stuff. My violin around my neck. 
<laughs> but it was great to get back and have fresh milk at, Yay. <laughs> at camp. Um, what's the one? In the, it's a camp uh, on the Puget Sound. Uh, it's not the one I left. It's, it's, it's another one that very people, few people oh, oh, know about. Oh, you came about. into Seattle area? Yeah. Oh, we did, uh -huh. But we were discharged at Fort Lewis. Okay. But we, we stopped at another place and ate a meal, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 70 miles yeah. from the Astoria yeah. to Seattle. Yeah. And <laughs> evidently they decided, well, they'd let some of the troops out for a meal at this other place. And oh. that, that's where we had fresh milk for the first time. <laughs> you bet. Now, when you first saw the sighting of American soil, what was that like? You know, it was great, but not as much rejoicing on my part as staying in Manila and getting off of that 45-day oh. <laughs> journey. <laughs> I can appreciate that. <laughs> so let's see, you uh, came back to the Seattle area for Lewis, about 1946 then? Yeah. Were you discharged from the service at that time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then? Then I was on uh, my own and wasn't uh, long before I got married. Oh, where did you meet her? Well, I met my wife at a... Um, a dinner in Sacramento uh, when I was in the service. I met this nurse. Uh -huh. Her name was Pansy, believe it or not. <laughs> <That's cute. laughs> so we had been writing, but I thought she'd already married by this time because we'd ceased writing for a while. Uh -huh. But it turned out I found out she was still single and I hurriedly went up to my room that we were living in um, near Vancouver, Washington, mm -hmm. and I had an upstairs room, and uh, I wrote her a letter and says, I just got a, a <laughs> job with the Bonneville Power Company because they were supposed to give veterans mm -hmm. their old job back or something close to it. Mm -hmm. Well, my job with Bonneville was chopping weeds at the uh, bottom of the telephone pole, oh but when gosh. they found out I could type, they gave me a job <laughs> typing at the big um, place near Vancouver. What's the name of that, that was, uh, substation? Anyway, it has a name. Uh -huh. and they gave me a job in which I was in charge of 130 or 150,000 items. Oh, power equipment from pliers to oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. hot sticks <laughs> oh to anything that a lineman might need them. Um, I had to keep track of who had it oh and my gosh. Keep, keep it posted so that if anybody wanted a tool, they'd know who had it. Well, that sounds like a logistical nightmare. Well, it one. was. The guy was way behind. <laughs> and. I was trying to catch up. Oh my goodness. Well, wait a minute. We got sidetracked. What happened to this? What happened to Pansy? Well, <laughs> when I found out she was still single, I said, well, how about getting together? I said, <laughs> I have this job, but I don't know whether you let me off. I'd only had it a couple of weeks. Uh -huh. and, but when he heard my story, he said, oh, you can go over behind anyway. <laughs> so I took an airplane trip down and we, we met and within three or four days we were engaged. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. And how many years of marriage? Oh, um, I forgot. I think it was 62. That's about I think it was, 60, was it 52? 62, 62 I think. 62. Yeah. yeah, this is and a, she, uh -huh. she got uh, this uh, Alzheimer mm -hmm. and um, what's that other disease? Not dementia, Parkinson's? Yes. Dementia? Yeah. Dementia and Parkinson's. Parkinson's, yes. that seems good. Parkinson's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go to get uh -huh. Anyway, she, it came to the point where we could car hardly communicate. Oh. She couldn't finish the sentence. Oh, I could tell there was something going wrong and uh -huh. we got some home health of uh, uh -huh. uh, people 
and the hospice got involved. And yeah. and my so sister, she was passed sister away. Was living there. Okay. Was this here or where were you? In, in College was, Place. In College Place. Yeah. Was, okay. So 62 years, and then let's see, I'm counting three children. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Roger My and Lee and, and Lou. And Melba Lou plays and the, Lee. in the symphony yes. and okay. Lee has a copy of the orchestra that I played in for uh, 34 years. Oh I played, my. played in uh, Walla Walla Sydney. Symphony which oh is the, the, they claim to be the longest continuous orchestra west of the Mississippi. Oh my. There's some of the big cities had orchestras earlier but they lacked know-how to st stay together and the, mm -hmm. the, the board of the Walla Walla Symphony were able to keep this orchestra functioning. We went to the concert last night. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, well we're going to take up maybe uh, Vic, uh, uh, I'm going to have you hold this up uh, so the camera can get this. The and Walla Walla that's the Walla Walla Symphony. Can you hang on? Can you can see you, that bit? Yeah, the oldest yeah. orchestra. Can you, can you west hold the book? The, yeah, can the you hold the book? The oldest continuous uh -huh. symphony west of the Mississippi. Look at and that. I was privileged to play on it for 34 years, and I retired in 2003 because uh -huh. I was getting um, too. Um, yeah. uh -huh. I guess you. I and a hundred years of Walla Walla Symphony. Yeah. I and getting, you were there last night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was t too tiring to yeah. to play stuff like the Beethoven Ninth Symphony, and it wore me out so much. Sure. I said, "This is not anymore for me." Sure. Uh, but what a story! Did you teach at the university while all there? Yes, I, I taught. But between 50 and 54, oh. and I taught in the Seattle Public Schools okay. for three years. Great. And then I went back. I was 18 years connected with a school in Lincoln, Nebraska. Great. And I taught elementary mainly. Wow. But I, I liked college teaching, but mm -hmm. there's something about the, how quick these young kids learn that on. inspires me. So I love, love, love my elementary school teaching. Yeah. What a fulfilled life you have <laughs> had, Melvin. Is there the service and your experiences, can you say that it's any way it has affected your life, being in the service? The military service um, I, I say one thing. I was fed up with books. And I told people that, you know, it's nice to have a rest from having to get assignments done, mm -hmm. term papers, and, and I said it was, it's nice to have a rest from all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoyed the military for a I didn't have to be involved with schoolwork, yeah. but but afterwards I go, I go back into it. But I'm as a teacher and not the student. There you go. So it made a difference. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say they love going to the military to avoid homework. That's a new that's a new one. <laughs> Is there anything? that you would like to add to this wonderful interview that I overlooked or missed? Well, I told my um, son the other day what I really have missed a lot of, of, of um, my total life is of um, communication with people. Lee's a good communicator. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, uh -huh. I turned out to be a piano tuner for a, a living, but I'd go to do my tuning and leave and mm -hmm. say very little. Mm -hmm. But Lee makes a lot of friends. Yeah, just different and, gifts. And uh -huh. I, I, had, I didn't take advantage of some of the opportunities I had to make friends. Mm -hmm. And these friends 
can be very valuable mm -hmm. and they can add a lot of richness to your life. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, I missed out a lot on well, things that Lee's enjoying uh -huh. and I didn't. Mm -hmm. And um, I was saying that uh, a lot of people as old as I am, they can point to different individuals that they influence from being atheist or uh, rebel, uh, re rebels mm -hmm. to being a Christian and lovers of God. Mm -hmm. And I missed that. I, I mean, I, I didn't take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like being a missionary uh, in the Mormon church, for instance. That adds to the richness of the, the Mormon in, uh, influence on mm -hmm. society. And being a, a, a Seventh-day Adventist um, and brought up in a Christian home, mm -hmm. I really should have felt more of an um, obligation of sharing that advantage with other people. Whereas I spent my uh, extra hours building things mechanically. They, these things that I build take hours. So I often. can imagine. But Melvin, in your own way, I don't know you, but in your way, what a blessing you've been in your creativity and your music and uh, building have, things. Yeah, I have had some, uh, had, uh, some good returns from my men music teaching experiences. Some of the people admire my patience with <laughs> young kids just mm -hmm. learning, you know. So it's kind of like one of my music teachers, he said, well, you can be one of these great artists, teacher, and lift talented kids a mile, or you can have more kids to be responsible for and lift them a foot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in other words, he compared it that you can have a small influence on a lot of people right. as a teacher, right. or you can be a real expert and sought after individual and can do the kind of work that finishes off an artist's mm -hmm. career. There you go. So, so I chose to work with children. Think of the seeds you've planted. Yeah. And he and my mother had many, many friends, but Dad definitely had a mechanical passion. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. But it's the yin and the yang. In yeah, that. well, I've been a missionary for music, and, and there you go. that's the main thing. There? Oh. And uh, I, yes. I do get a retirement for 24 years of service. Great. Um, so. Half of my retirement is come from the career in music mm -hmm. and the rest of it Social Security. Great. So I get about $2,000 a month Great. from those two sources and mm -hmm. I learn to live with it. And I see, I can tell that you've raised some very wonderful children too. Well, I'm proud of them. Yeah, I can <laughs> well, see that. Well. I want to thank you so much for being here today. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have something to add? Uh, did you ever join any mil uh, veterans organizations? You know, um, I would be a member of the the, the v veterans of foreign wars, but um, I'm trying to save what little um, charitable money I have beyond what I need to keep uh, with, uh, you know, keep in the bank. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to mm -hmm. save as much as that to give to the Indians. Uh, I'm especially um, uh, soft on the, the Indians on the reservation because mm -hmm. I lived on a, an Indian reservation for four days. Oh. Uh, near where I used to live in Nebraska huh. and so starting with the Indians and then schools Catholic schools mm -hmm. um, I, I give to two or three different Catholic schools mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, there was one of the Catholic fathers
started a a rest home for the Cheyenne Indians in Ashland, Montana, oh. and he's responsible for their keep. And so I help him charitably, periodically. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of mail, about 25 or 30 letters uh, a day that oh. come to my house. My and well, they're they're a pest. Those, <laughs> those people that find out you're willing to give. And then you contribute. You can, political. I get a lot of political mail. You contribute, and you contribute to a number of veterans organizations. Oh. Yeah. Wow. But the question that they asked, were you ever involved in a veterans organization? No. But no. Uh, they, they write me all the time. They so want me to. To, uh, to the disabled to, to contribute to the organizations, and then I, uh, I'm holding off until I mm -hmm. do what I think is my share of support of of these other things, including families of fallen police officers. Oh, bless you. Yeah. Bless you for that. I just sent a, a letter today that has a check towards oh, the, that's great. The, the families of police officers were killed in line of duty. Bless you. So that's uh -huh. what takes my checkbook down, but I don't give big offerings. I try to share with a number of, and they know it, and they, take, mm -hmm. they pass my name to other people. They've got your address. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any grandchildren? Oh, yeah. We have <laughs> a he has three. three? grandchildren. Yeah. And uh, one boy and two girls. And then four and great grandchildren. Oh my! They're live, wire, you, they're live wires. Can you name and, their names? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you name their names for the video? Oh, uh, Brindley mm -hmm. is the, the daughter of my grandson. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charlie. And then Charlie uh, Drury. He has a a recent uh, sister <laughs> by the name of Stella, okay. and then uh, my uh, my um, my son Roger has a daughter who has a. Can I claim? <laughs> well, uh, your he has three grandchildren. Yeah. Uh, that's. Uh, Charlie, Lacey. Oh, I'm thinking of the great grand. Yes. <laughs> I was thinking of the great one. Charlie Drury, Lacey Drury, and Tara Johnson. Yeah. And then Charlie and his wife Sadie have two girls, and their names are Brindley and Stella. Oh, so, nice. that's the one I started yeah, thinking excellent. of being great grandchildren. <laughs> granddaughter, mm -hmm. Tara Johnson Engelman is her well, name. Well, I'll put it this way. She We're, has uh, this two, branch two of children. A, I say this branch of the Johnson <laughs> family is not very numerous. <laughs> I only have one living relative and that's oh. my sister. Okay. She's, and then a, she's a pianist and taught piano for about oh, 50 nice. years in, in uh, Port Angeles. Oh, and nice. she's she doesn't play anymore, and just the other day they said you can't drive anymore. Oh boy. So she's going to have to leave her house. Oh boy. Having been there over 50 years. Oh, that's tough. Yeah. Younger sister? She's just a, a couple years younger than oh, I. Okay. And her name is? Thelma. Thelma, and there were two other grand, great grandchildren? Yes, and uh -huh. um, uh, the two great grandchildren uh, that uh, are belong to Tara and mm -hmm. Jonathan Engelman okay. are Emmerich Engelman no, that's the one I couldn't and think of. Ainsley. Ainsley. Emmerich well, and Ainsley. We want to make sure Engelman. we have everybody included here for this video. Uh, uh, one more. <laughs> yeah. Do, you, do they play instruments and do you ever play with them? Oh, um, my grandchildren all play instruments, but my gra great grandchildren are too young yet. Yeah. What an influence. You have lived an amazing, <clears throat> successful life. 
Uh, and it ain't over you. You got another birthday. Uh, you got far from over. <laughs> well, some days are pretty precarious, but uh, as long as I can stay with Lee, I won't have to spend big money to go to one of these, uh, yeah. uh, what do you call, nice. rehab places. Yeah. Well, I actually, I actually live with him. Oh. So I'm staying with oh, my dad. Oh, <laughs> win-win. Yeah. Win-win. Well, I'm very, we're very impressed. Your recollection is really amazing. I uh, remember way back better than I do recently. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> I just, someday I don't know what day it is or anything. Yeah. Well, you did an amazing job in the interview and well, thank you so I much. I think life has been really uh, great for me. I, I, I tell people I've lived a charmed life, really. No great catastrophes, mm -hmm. nobody next to kin has passed away, oh. you know. That's amazing. That except is. my wife, and that's, that's yeah. about it. Well, you've lived a blessed life and you've been blessed. Thank you for yeah. the interview. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah.